Let me ask you to consider, seriously consider for just a moment. You know, we live in a casual culture. We live in a culture where words are not always taken um, at face value. We don't really examine the precision or the precise use of words. But let me ask you to consider for just a moment, what if what you ask of God, what you ask from him, he took very seriously to the point that what you ask from him could actually disqualify you from the kingdom. Make sure you ask, hear the question. What if, if in our lack of knowledge of the kingdom, we ask from him, ask him to give to us, bless us with, however you want to phrase it, when we ask for the things that we do, what if the asking of the question could disqualify you from the kingdom? Think it's possible? Well, actually, we're going to see in Matthew 18, we're going to see the question. I want you all to see this. This is how it's going to unfold. The question, the child, the stumbling block, and then the reason why. That's where we're going today. The question, the child, the stumbling block, and then the reason why. This is what I'm going to propose to you. I want to propose to you first off that the disciples are going to display by their question so much of an ignorance of the nature of God's kingdom that their question is going to cause Jesus to respond with the possibility for them that they are by their question disqualified from the kingdom. And then he is going to explain to them the nature of the kingdom that they should by this time have already known. Now, the way Matthew lays it out, he's going to say this is their question. Jesus is going to use a child as an example. And then he's going to talk about stumbling blocks, implying their question and the position they have with Jesus. He is going to imply you might be a stumbling block. And then he is going to say and explain the nature of the kingdom that they have undoubtedly missed that has led to such a uh, presumptuous question. Are y'all with me? Yeah. I want you to see the question. Here's the question. It's a familiar question. Verse, 18, verse 1, chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then... Notice the who then. The who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who's the greatest? Now, now y'all got to keep in mind, don't read into Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right, Mark tells you that they have been arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus overhears them. Matthew doesn't say that. Matthew says they have a boldness about what they want that they come right out and say to Jesus, who then is the greatest in the kingdom? Right? They don't have any idea that their question is inappropriate. They say, who's the greatest? Right? So don't read that Mark, uh, Mark makes it known that Jesus has this, you know, they have this contrast between Jesus going to Calvary and they're asking about who's going to be the greatest. You know, Mark may, makes it seem like it's just bad timing to be fighting about who's greatest when he's going to die. Matthew doesn't do that. It's a right up front question from the disciples. Jesus, who then is the greatest in the kingdom? Right, but you can almost sense they want to be the greatest in the kingdom. And then Jesus, now that's, that's just simply setting the stage for what's about to follow. And remember, you're trying to learn from Matthew what Matthew is trying to tell his readers. And Matthew is going to tell us that Jesus is going to bring a child to answer the question into their midst, right? 
So we've seen the question. The question is, who is the greatest? Right? And then Jesus, verse 2 says, called to himself a child, and he set him before them. He brings the child, and he sets the child in front of the disciples, undoubtedly using the child as sort of an illustration to teach them regarding their question. But here's what you got to get. Where Jesus goes doesn't seem like he's answering the question originally, but he is. But Jesus is not simply answering their question. He's trying to teach them how inappropriate their question is. Are y'all with me? He is trying to say, you don't understand the nature of God and his kingdom. That's why you're asking such a bad question. Y'all with me? Because sometimes just what we ask of God tells us we don't know him. Are y'all with me? So he says, truly I say to you, unless you are converted, my, my, my translation says converted, and become like children, li listen to his words, you will not even enter the kingdom. <laughs> I love the way he answers the question, right? They say, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Because we know we're getting in, right? We've already established we're going in. W once we get in, we want to be the greatest. Or we want to know how to rise to the top, become the greatest. And Jesus says to them, unless you, it's actually the word, sometimes it's translated turn, right? Your Bible says turn. Mine says converted. I want you to get an image of what Jesus said because in the single word is the nature of the kingdom. He says, you're going this way and the kingdom is that way. Unless you do this, you won't even get there. Y'all with me? He says, so unless you turn and become like the little children because the children are moving in the right direction and you're not. You won't even enter the kingdom. But, but I want you to notice, uh, Matthew is very precise with his choosing of words, right? Or Jesus is very precise in his choosing of words. He says, unless you are turned. He did not say, unless you turn or you are converted or you convert yourself. All right? you will not enter. He says, unless you are turned, it's in the passive, right? That suggests, unless you are turned by someone, you won't enter. Y'all with me? Because that's the nature of the kingdom. The nature of the kingdom is that all of us who are in it have been turned by someone else. You don't turn and go inherit the kingdom. <laughs> that's so good, I like that. But he's not done yet, right? But the child is just the illustration. Unless, like the child, you turn, you won't even get in. Now, there's always a lot of talk about what is the nature of the child that the Lord Jesus is using. Some people will go on this long rant. You know, you go in and read commentaries. They'll go on this long rant about the nature of a child. They say, well, a child is innocent. Anybody who got children know, no, they're not. <laughs> they're not innocent, right? That's not the point. How do you decide what is he using the child to illustrate? How do you decide? Somebody say something. Context. Wonderful answer, Q. Because it's right in the context. What is like the child that Jesus is trying to get them to see? Well, listen to what he says. He says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom. So what is the child like that you must become like? The child is humble, right? You see, children don't actually start to fight about who's better than who until they get much older in life, right? This is, this is the Greek word padaya. It's actually a very young child. You know, when, when the children are very young, they don't even care what clothes you put on them, right? It's not until they get older that they say, well, so-and-so's got on more expensive clothes than me, and now they're talking about who's going to be better looking and greater than who. At a very young age, they don't care. Right? 
They just don't care. And so there's a humility about a child, a very young child, that Jesus says you must have to not only get into the kingdom, but that's what makes you greatest in the kingdom, is humility. Right? That's the direct answer. Right? But here's where he's going to go. I'm going to tell you where he's going. I'm going to show you how he gets there. What, where he's going is, is to say, if you had known the nature of the kingdom, you wouldn't have been asking about who's greatest. You would have just been humble. Yeah. <laughs> See, the, their lack of humility assumes I'm next to you. I'm getting into the kingdom. I'm just trying to find out how I can be the best in it. Jesus is saying the nature of the kingdom is nobody gets in because they choose to. They have been turned by the Father, and you ought to be glad that the Father turns you to even enter. That's a, that's a, a humbling thing to think because nobody earns the kingdom. Everybody in the kingdom is just grateful that the Father has turned them towards the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Are y'all with me? Amen. See, Christian folk need to learn that lesson. You know, I was... Um, Yesterday, me and my son, we went to uh, Denny's, right? He had some homework to do, and we went to Denny's, and we were in there. And uh, you, you ever notice you can, really, you can spot church people? Yeah. You don't know what? They look a certain way, don't they? <laughs> so, uh, family came in, right? Uh, the father had on a tie, you know, but it was loosened, right? Uh, wife had on one of those church dresses. Y'all know what I'm talking about? She had on one of those church dresses and the church shoes. This is, these are real church folk, Christy. She's still wearing stockings. Because, you know, the pious, the righteous still wear stockings. Right? They have on, uh, they have on those open-toed shoes, and they still have on stockings, where you can see the knitting of the stockings right at the... T Come on now, y'all know those are how church folk look. Right? right? And, the, and the little boy, right, he's about my son's age, Q, and he got on a suit. He's got on a suit with a vest. Because <laughs> that's how church folk look, right? And But here's, here's, the, here's the point I'm making, right? Here's the point I'm making. There is no sense of humility in their approach to other people. You know, they, they, they walk into the place like they bring their righteousness in. Y'all know what I mean? They wear it on the outside. It's a somber look that says I'm conservative um, I am um, you, and almost like they wear on their sleeves the things that the sinful stuff they don't do no sense of I'm like everybody else right uh, and the reason why is there is a sense and always has been in, 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 in religion right even Judaism there has always been an erroneous sense that you have to sort of earn some sort of place with God there's some stuff you gotta do everybody will tell you you can't be a Christian and do certain things you gotta not do some things to be religious Christian have faith all of those things and the disciples have the same ideology right that's some stuff we've left behind. You know, we've left some things. We've left some family. We're earning some things with God. Okay, Jesus, we've been on this trip with you for a long time, and we know that you said you're inaugurating the kingdom. We're close to you, you know, because we've been here the whole time. And so now that you're about to establish your kingdom, because they know something's on the horizon with this going to Jerusalem and dying, you know, they can feel this sort of climax coming, right? And so they say, okay, the kingdom is about to be inaugurated, and we want our place in it. That by our walking with you over these last three years, we're entitled to, right? But we want to make sure because we're, you know, we're humble in our, you know, in our religious sense. How do we get there? How do we become the greatest? Make it straight <laughs> And so, here, here, here is the point. Good try, but not the right answer. <laughs> And here's the point that Jesus is making, right? Why do you think you're entitled to the kingdom? Yeah. It's the point he's making. What makes you think you are on your way in? And he says, unless you... But here, here's, I want you all to watch this, this theological conundrum, if you will. You have to be turned, but he says, until you humble yourself like the child, you won't enter. 
Now, how does that work? Wait a minute. I got to be turned, but I must humble myself like the child. It's actually in the, in the middle voice. This is something you got to do for yourself, but you got to be turned. You can't turn yourself, but you must humble yourself. Now, now how does that work, though? The only way I can figure this out, I've been trying to, I've been racking my mind about this one, Jake. Uh, here's the only thing I can think. You, you must first, before salvation, you must humble yourself to know you can't get in. That's prerequisite. You must first get to the place where you say, I'm lost. The kingdom is over there and I can't go there. You must first humble yourself like the child. And when you have humbled yourself, you can be turned. turned. So, so that here, get this, get this. Salvation is all the work of the Lord. You can't say, I humbled myself and was saved. Yeah. Right? Because you can humble yourself and he can still choose not to turn you. <laughs> Y'all with me? You can humble yourself and just keep going in that direction, humbled, and the kingdom's over here. But when you humble yourself and he chooses to turn you, you can be saved. So now that you get into the kingdom, how'd you get in there? Because he turned me. He turned me. And everybody in the kingdom lives in the kingdom Humbly, because they know the only reason I'm here is because he turned me. He turned me. But, but watch this. Jesus is not done yet. The lesson's not over. He says, uh, verse number four, who then humbles himself as this child? He is the greatest in the kingdom. Now get this. Uh, you got to humble yourself to get in. But humility is also the road to greatness in the kingdom. Y'all see it? If you can be humble, you can be the greatest in the kingdom. Now, it's, it's only with God, right, that, that more than one can be the greatest. <laughs> Did y'all get it? You, you can be the greatest and in the kingdom, and we can all be the greatest. <laughs> y'all get it? So that we're all on the same level, and we're all the greatest in the kingdom. Right? Now, see, in the world, only, there can only be one greatest. That makes everybody fight for greatest. But he says, if you can be humble, you can be the greatest in the kingdom. So there's no tearing in the kingdom. But there's a sense with God, I'm the greatest. And you're the greatest. And I'm okay with us both being the greatest. Why? Because we're humble enough to know that none of us deserve to be in here. Watch this, but he's not done with the lesson yet. Because here's what's really important. What's important is that you come away not with a what I must do, but what is the kingdom like that I must believe. Mm. You with me? He could have stopped with, then humble yourself. They said, who's the greatest? You want to be great? Then humble yourself. Okay, then we can go off and humble ourselves. Right? But it's not what he's after. What he's after is, I want you to know what God is doing and what his kingdom is like so that you can live in it without all those contradictory understandings about it that get you into trouble and cause there to be conflict between people. So he goes on and he says, and whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Now, now get this. In the context of who's the greatest and humility, he says, and if you receive one like this little one in my name, you receive me. Now here's where you got to understand some parallelisms, right? The receiving of Jesus, he puts in parallel with becoming the greatest. Y'all see it? He says, you can become the greatest by being humble. And if you receive one, you will receive me. Y'all see it? The, the, I want y'all to notice this. Look at your Bible for a minute. And I underline this. Verse 4 starts with, whoever then humbles himself. Y'all see it? Verse 5 says, and whoever receives. Mm -hmm. So that the, the way Matthew writes it, it's the one who humbles himself is parallel with the one who receives. 
Because to receive a child is an act of humility. Y'all with me? It is also in parallel, the, he is the greatest in the kingdom, is then in parallel with receives me. Y'all see it? Because he wants them to understand this thing. Listen, to receive a humble child, to take as a part of your fellowship someone who is humble enough to know they're just lucky to be in or they're blessed to be in, is to receive the Lord Jesus because that's the nature of the kingdom. Amen. See, that, that's, a, that's also one of those issues that the congregations have always had. How do you receive other people into the fellowship so that the fellowship reflects the congregation of God and also reflects what the kingdom will be like? I receive them, why? Because they're humble like everybody else in the kingdom. And when we do so, we receive the Lord Jesus, he says. That's the road to the greatness that is the nature of the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, there's no competition. He says, you, you need to know that. It, listen, if you want to become greatest, you want to be tiered, then come down with everybody else. Y'all get it? Come down with everybody else. Receive other people just like you do uh, yourself. And now you're going to be receiving Jesus because in the kingdom, we're all greatest by being humble. Yeah. Y'all with me here? But he, he's not finished with the lesson yet. We're still with the child. And he says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Yeah. Right? It would be better for him that a, uh, better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus is choosing his illustration wisely because he knows the idea of having a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the deepest part of the sea gives a reaction from his hearers that says he means business here. <laughs> right? But here's what I want you to notice. We talked about this last week, didn't we, Christy? The word translated stumble, right? is going to obviously tie all of this section of scripture together, right? He talks about the one who causes one of these little ones, that's the little one who's in the center as an illustration. Don't, don't lose this, right? Don't lose the, the, the big picture and the details. He's not talking about causing a child to stumble because the child just illustrates the believer who is humble enough to know he doesn't earn the kingdom. So when he says, if you cause one of these little ones, he's not talking about causing a child to stumble. He's talking about causing someone who is humble enough to know he has not earned the kingdom to stumble. Mm. By with me? He says, if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, and then later he's going to say, woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Same word used for stumble earlier. And he says, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. Same word, right? And then he says, but woe to the one whom the stumbling comes. Same word. And then he's going to say, and if your hand or your foot causes you to, that same word, right? Verse 9 says, and if your eye causes you to stumble. Same word, right? And then he's going to also, uh, he's going to tie them together, right? with this idea of stumbling. But here's the question you gotta ask yourself. What does the stumbling block have to do with the humility that he has just been talking about? In other words, how does the beginning of verse seven where he talks about woe to the, uh, woe to the world because of stumbling blocks, how does that fit with what he has just said? What well, he has linked them together with if you cause one of these little ones to stumble. He's talking to the disciples who have asked an inappropriate question about who's the greatest. Y'all with me? Here's what I think he's saying. Let me be direct. When Christian people, or a better way of saying it, if, if culturally Christian people keep talking about what Jesus is doing to make them great people, you could become a stumbling block for people who want into the kingdom because they hear what I must do that they know they cannot do to get into the kingdom and it causes them to stumble at believing in the Lord Jesus to get into the kingdom and woe to you if you cause them to stumble. We are giving people the impression they must do things to get into the kingdom and in so doing we become a stumbling block. 
And he says, when you do so, it'd be better that you had a millstone hung around your neck and cast into the deepest part of the ocean. So how seriously does Jesus take teaching people the path of the law? That's been the message throughout the scripture. Why does Jesus re respond so angrily against the Pharisees? Because they're a stumbling block. They say, well, this is what the law says that you must do. And the sinner who knows he's a sinner is saying, but I can't do that. And they're saying, but look at me, I do it. And they get more and more in despair because they're going to be honest enough to say, I can't do that. And then Jesus says, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble and think he cannot enter the kingdom by me alone, be better for you. Mm. Have a millstone hung around your neck and cast into the sea. That's good. Now, now watch this, watch this. Then he uses a, a metaphor to heighten the necessity of not letting anything cause you to stumble in your understanding of how you enter the kingdom. Watch this. He says, and uh, woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. But listen to, the, listen to this very carefully. It's inevitable that they come. Listen, here's what he just said. In your, in your coming to faith in the Lord Jesus, the stumbling block that is inevitable for us all is to overcome the world's telling you you're not good enough. Or you must be good enough to enter the kingdom. That's typical. That's normal. That's inevitable, he says. Now he says, listen, there's a woe to those who are the stumbling block, but it is inevitable that every church, every pastor, every Christian have to battle against those who tell you what law you must follow to enter the kingdom. Mm. Y'all with me? That's why we fight, fight that battle all the time. And then he says, but watch this. Using a metaphor, he says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, and what is stumbling in this case? Yeah, not, not turning away from Christ, but stumbling at the fact that Jesus is the one who gets you in. If anything like your hand or your foot is in the way of your trusting Jesus by grace, through faith alone, cut it off. Now, here's where we had some trouble. Because some passages will translate stumble as cause you to sin. Your Bible actually may say cause you to sin. Right? But it gives you the impression that not sinning is what the problem is. And if I don't stop sinning to the point of cutting off my hand that's causing me to sin, right, then I won't inherit the kingdom, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus is saying. Wow. Y'all with me? Because sinning is not the problem. He knows you sin. That's why you're humble. That's why you need to be humble, right? So that sinning is not the problem, right? The problem is stumbling to think that to stop sinning is your way into the kingdom. And he says, if you're, because here's what Jesus already taught that makes me know that's not true. The body doesn't cause the person to sin. Amen. You don't steal because your hand is doing something other than what your heart wants to do. So to cut your hand off is not going to fix your stealing problem. It's just a metaphor to teach the seriousness of faith in Jesus, right? And so he uses two metaphors, right? He uses the hand to foot, right? And then he says, or if your eye causes you to stumble, right? Then pluck it out, right? And he's, but it's just a metaphor to teach the seriousness of lack of faith in Jesus in a culture where doing what is right gets you into the kingdom, He's saying, fight that thing no matter what. You know, this is just theology. It's the same battle Paul fought with the, with the Galatians. Remember? There's some people who came into Galatia who said, you know, okay, now that you're saying, there's still some things you have to do to be righteous. Right? Same fight that Jesus is dealing with the apostles about. Because I could just see the apostles are thinking, yeah, so that if I don't make sure, if I don't take circumcision and I don't remember the feast and all those things, then I won't be greatest in the kingdom. Y'all hear it? And here's what church people say. You know why, Christy, why church people don't like 
that why, why the typical church person doesn't like the guy who falls in and out of church because they don't want the impression to be, I show up every Sunday. I go to church, Sunday school, I pay my tithes. That joker right there, he falls in here in and out. He can't inherit like me. I'm doing way too much for him to be like me, and I don't want you to think I'm like that either. <laughs> and so they treat you all snotty-like. They all nice, nasty to you. Well, it's good to see you again. <laughs> Been a while since we've seen you in church, Christy. Nice, nasty. You know, I'm here every Sunday. Good to see you fall in every now and then. <laughs> but see, the, the person who falls in is out there sinning. Yeah, we know they're sinning, right? We know they're creating sin. But listen, something about I'm in big trouble, let me go to Jesus, is the act of humility. And when they come, they just might be turned. But then there's the other person who's in the church every Sunday and have no humility, right? Thinking that they're inheriting and they're better than you and they will be greater than you in the kingdom. And watch the message Jesus is going to give. Watch the message. This is where the, this is where the nature of the kingdom gets explained. Watch this. Uh, Jesus says, after telling them, you know, the two metaphors, the hand and the, hand and the foot, cut it off, if you, if you know, so that you don't enter the kingdom, uh, so that uh, you don't be cast into, into eternal hell. He said, pluck out the eyes so that you, you know, you, you can enter the into life blind. It's better than to be cast into hellfire. And he says, so don't despise, he says, the humble. Father's always watching the humble. He's got angels in charge of the humble. And then watch this. He says to them, I love the way he starts. He says, so what do you think? <laughs> it's a great question, isn't it? So what do you think? If a man had a hundred sheep, now y'all remember, every story Jesus tells has a context. The best way to understand the story is to know why is he telling it? Why is he telling this story about the, the, the hundred sheep? The context is the question, right? What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, I love that word gone astray. One of the sheep, he says, has gone astray. Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go search for the one that is astray? Mm. Now listen, let's be honest. Let's not read the Bible as if we have always been sanctimonious, right? <laughs> for most of us, if we've got 100 sheep on the mountainside and one of them goes astray, we're not going to put at risk the 99 for the one knucklehead who went astray, are we? That's not a value that we have. I'm not going to risk my whole flock as I go searching for the one who chose to go astray, are we? But then Jesus says, because Jesus is asking the question, he's like, y'all would go after the one, wouldn't you? And the disciples are going, yeah, that's right, we would. Sure we would. Right? Already he's got them off balance. You can feel it, right, Q? And he says, and if it turns out, <laughs> I love the hypothetical nature of the question, and if it turns out that he finds it, listen, let me just tell you all right off, that's the whether or not the father chooses to turn that stray. Same hypothetical. If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more Listen to the language. More than the ninety and nine which have not gone astray. That's against human nature though, right? Am I really going to go traipsing after the one that went astray? And when I find that knucklehead someplace he should not have been, am I really then going to rejoice more over him than the ninety and nine who did not go astray? Really? Am I going to heap more praise on the one I found than the ones who did not go astray? Will you really? But there's Jesus who's telling the story. And then watch what he says. So it is not 
the will of my father, of your father who is in heaven, that one of these little ones perish. He just gave him the nature of the kingdom. Let me tell y'all, let me give you, let me, let me try to, because I've been studying it longer than you have. Let me help you to understand it. He says, in the kingdom, everyone in are those who went astray. You get it? Everybody in the kingdom are those who went astray. Wow. And, listen, and the father went looking for you because you went astray. All of the church folk are the ones who stayed on the mountain. <laughs> they did not go astray. But listen, in the kingdom, who's God going to rejoice over more? He's rejoicing over the strays. The strays will be the greatest in the kingdom. They'll get attention from the father in the kingdom. Why is that? Because listen to the theology. He went looking for you. When he found you and you were humble enough to recognize you were a stray, he turned you and brought you back in. So that everybody in the kingdom are strays. We're not the ones who did not go astray. Y'all know, you're the stray, right? Amen. You're the one who went after all of your lusts and desires and forsook God and shook your fist in his face. You are the prodigal. You are not the older brother. <laughs> all of us are like sheep. All of us are like sheep. We've gone astray. Yeah. Now I want y'all to, to put the pieces together. Can you see then? The strays don't ask who's the greatest in the kingdom. <laughs> We're just glad to be in. We don't start going, okay, now that I'm in, how do I get to top position? And see, here's what he's saying to you. If you just know the nature of the kingdom, you don't even ask that question. This, this is what, this is what uh, Alexander McLaren said. He said, the very question condemned them as incapable of entrance. Yeah. Mm. Now, I want you all to bring this home. How many church folks think that because they have Jesus, they're entitled to greatness? How many of us are claiming greatness in Jesus' name? How many of us are claiming that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us? Out of context. <laughs> Because in that context, what are we conquering? Persecution. We're conquering persecution and doubt in the fact that Jesus alone will get us in. Mm. That's what we're overcoming. We're not overcoming our financial struggles. No. We're not overcoming our boss at work who wants to hold us back. We're not rising to the top in all of life's ways. And when you ask for that, the very question may condemn you as not capable of entering. Because everybody in it have gone astray. And we're just glad to be in. Amen.